But most importantly, I think we were being uh, joined by Lara Walters uh, this morning. I'm really delighted that Lara can join us because it is a big day in Strasbourg today. Lara, you should really know her. If you don't, you're in the wrong webinar, I think, because Lara was the rapporteur, a successful rapporteur on gender balance a few weeks ago. Well done, Lara, for that. And you were the mm -hmm. shadow rapporteur on the CSRD. Well done on that as well with the agreement last week. Again, good timing for this webinar. And we're looking forward to you being the rapporteur on the sustainable corporate governance file. So you've kind of really got them all. Um, and as I say, thank you very much for being with us uh, this morning. You're very welcome. I can hear myself back a little bit. I'm just going to use these, see if we can improve things. Is that working better for you? For me, I think this is better. Perfect. We hear you perfectly. So, Good. so again, uh, thank you very much. I mean, maybe starting a little bit, <clears throat> how important, I mean, in, in the portfolio and all the work that, that you're doing and the European Parliament is doing, how, how do you see sustainable finance? How important is it as, as kind of a, a building block in, in the broader objectives to meet the 2050 um, you know, zero targets. Hugely important. And um, I was thinking about this question a little bit before we started. And um, the phrase that came to my mind was um, money makes the world go round. It's, it's really that simple. We can have all the political intentions we want on sustainability, um, transitioning to a fossil free economy and so forth. But without the um, the work uh, being done or the actual day-to-day -day decisions by multinationals, by banks, insurance and so forth, um, that will be a lot of goodwill, but we won't actually get there. Um, so in everything we do now, I think it is so important that we take that business community along, um, but also that us as um, the European Parliament, that we force our way to sustainable finance when needed. No, and I think you, you, you've demonstrated that, uh, and we come to that in a moment. <clears throat> but maybe follow up. I mean, it's interesting. We've got uh, participants from the US joining this morning, from Asia joining. There's a huge, uh, you know, focus on Europe in this whole debate. Europe is seen as the front runner, and potentially seen as the international standard setter for many of these issues. How do you see that and, and how, how ambitious do you think Europe can be, should be, and where might be the limits to that ambition? Hmm. Um, well, I'm aware, of course, of the conversation on international standards going on, on the potential discrepancies we might have between, between what we're doing with AFRAG um, and what is happening internationally. But me as a um, lawmaker at the moment, I can only say that, of course, it's my wish um, that Europe does take uh, upon itself that trailblazer role. And the reason for that is that I'm quite proud of our consensual way of policy making in Brussels. Um, and I think when we are at our best, um, there is the Brussels effect and we have effects beyond our borders because we have done something that hasn't been done before, um, but that is very much uh, that is very much needed. Um, what I think is 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 good about um, the way that we take decisions is we've got a a, a multi-country parliament, we've got a an institutional architecture um, that takes into account so much expertise and um, so many differences, and that together I think when we're at our best can lead to good results. Of course. Um, it can also mean that we get bogged down um, in difficult discussions and that we don't advance. But me as, as a, a, an MEP in 2022, I very much wish that we can, um, that we can use our clout um, and our vision. And, and let's be honest, I think that our model at the moment is more consensual than, say, in the, in the U.S. politically. Um, I, can, I, I really hope we can use that for the, for the better. No, thank you. And I might come back to how we make different frameworks interact with each other if, if we've got the time. But maybe one last kind of introductory question. We, we can't speak today without at least mentioning the vote later. I'm not asking you to predict the outcome. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I mean, how do you... But, well, any comments, any thoughts? Because as I say, this is the elephant in the room today. We couldn't have picked a better day for that. So. Yeah. Um, well, full transparency, I, I will be voting. Um, I will be voting against. That's to say, um, I have concerns about labeling 
um, gas or fossil fuels generally, uh, nuclear as um, as sustainable. Um, but the question is not so much what what is my vote. Um, I think there's there's uh, there's there's also no point probably in going through the arguments. I mean, for for me, arguments are that. Um, what we're doing here is we're 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 trying to future proof our economy, and we've got about ten years for that, um, if if at all. And so I think that the decisions that we take on what we label as green, they they matter. They matter in where the money goes. They matter in the decisions that will be taken and how quickly they will be taken. And as much as in Western Europe we might have already. Um, taken some steps on the path to, to sustainability. There's also countries that haven't done that, and I think that um, uh, that that uh, that there um, we, we won't get there by not being extremely honest with ourselves. That said, of course, what we're doing here is is labeling. We're not saying that um, that no nuclear reactors cannot be be built. But for me, the arguments of um, of experts, of course, that we need to look to in this case um, on on all the other factors that come into this, um, on the expensiveness of nuclear, on the methane waste that or uh, that that um, that is brought up when when we when we extract gas. All of these things for me have have made it very difficult to, in good conscience, say, well, no, actually, this is sustainable. Sorry. Now I have gone into to my arguments where I come down on those. So I feel that ultimately, like with with many things, there can be so many arguments um, and. And yet, I think most peeling, most most people voting on this today will have an intuitive feeling uh, here um, that they might be following, for better or worse. No, no. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Lara, for, for for that. I think we'll be looking today also a little bit at transition, and I think you're right. I think partly the problem is we're blurring the line between what is environmentally green and what should be part of a transition, and and good, maybe the 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 parameters aren't perfect there. Uh, as as designed, uh, if we had more time, I think you know we would spend more time on transition per se. But I think with that, I would love to come to the CSRD. Of course, a big success in the trilogues last week, <laughs> really well done. <clears throat> I mean, maybe your thoughts on how the negotiations went. Uh, you know what you see as the biggest achievements out of the uh, the file, and also a bit your expectations now towards the industry in in implementing the CSRD. <laughs> um, well, I don't envy industry at the moment, I, I have to say. I'm aware that there's a huge amount um, coming at it um, and also in a short time span. Um, I don't envy EFRAG either at the moment, having to, to make all of this uh, possible and, and, and applicable and workable for everyone. Um, but I am proud of what we have done here. And for me, um, politically, the reason for that is um, the phrase I read um, somewhere, which is what gets measured gets managed. And I think that that is so true. Um, what we're doing here, of course, is an exercise in transparency. Um, and that transparency is valuable, I think, not only um, to uh, us, to supervisors, um, or, or those you know who will be pouring through um, the data that will become available, but also very much to companies themselves. Um, and I think that the the, um, the the necessity now of zooming in more on issues that very many of, of, of which I think are, are quite commonsensically important to companies um, will also within companies push towards more sustainability. I don't think you will find many boardrooms that will ignore um, new information if it proves to be, um, you know, business sensitive. And I, I really hope that what we're doing here is both providing more transparency to, let's say, an external world where it is useful, but also internally in, in companies. Um, and I think that the the time was was right. I mean, uh, again, you know, politically, uh, the, the concerns of, 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 of greenwashing, of course, were there, but also the the more um, the more practical arguments that we heard time and time again of more information is needed, more granular information is needed, more comparable information is needed, and I really think that on that we have um, delivered. Now, you, this audience here, will be the judge of how how um, well we have been able to do that. Um, as as always, um, you know, trilogues are are, are compromises. Um, but uh, I think that the the the, uh, the granularity on um, equal treatment um, when, when it comes to, to human rights, collective bargaining and the coverage of that, even things like, like gender equality, um, when we talk about governance, business ethics, whistleblowing, 
all of these things, I think for all of these, um, not to mention, of course, um, uh, environment, uh, ecosystems, uh, climate change, I think for all of these individual points, you will be able to find stories in newspapers of um, uh, things having gone wrong or, or um, things having been mismanaged. And I think that that means that on all of these, it will be um, uh, so useful uh, to make sure, because whether those things were purposeful or not, to make sure that um, that there's uh, information that is actionable out there. No, I think you're right. And we're spending a lot of time today in the seminar to discuss, you know, some of the practicalities of implementing the CSRD. <clears throat> And, and not saying it can't be done, but just how is it done? And, and how is it done in a meaningful and comparable way? Because it doesn't matter, it make sense, everybody reporting their own way. But I think one common theme we're seeing a lot is, and you made that point just now, it's really about learning. I think nobody will be perfect in 2025. They will not be absolutely perfect in 2027. A lot of it will be estimates in the early days. Data still has to be collected, has to be kind of grouped together. Technology companies have to find ways of bringing that data together. There's a bit, lot happening. And I think, what is your expectation as to the, the functioning of the CSRD? Because I think there needs to be at the beginning at least a little bit of goodwill and a little bit of leeway. N not an excuse for not doing things, but, but recognizing that learning curve. And I think if you look at the US, for example, they're nervous about all of this because there you've got very strict liability regimes, for example. At the moment the company says something, and if they don't do that, they could have massive fines. How do we balance that you know, learning exercise, which will take a bit of time, with, with these legal obligations and, and, let's say, liability risks that go, come with it? It's a dangerous question because, of course, if I now say that, um, you know, there's a there's there's actually there's actually a lot of flexibility here, or you know, we yeah. will um, we will close our eyes, um, then I don't think my colleague Pascal Durand will be uh, will be very very happy with it. Me. It wasn't meant that um, way. I wasn't trying to uh, you know catch you out. No, no, please don't. No, you know, it's more. No, I think. But I, I think there, there, there is an awareness, of course, that uh, that all of this needs to be done quickly. Um, uh, we, we get feedback, of course, also from AFRAG that even uh, getting the standards that will be needed for this um, done in time is is really no mean feat, and that that's difficult. Um, let alone, of course, for the the, the companies that um, that will need to, to to report on this rather quickly. Now. Um, this um, negotiation has been led by my colleague Pascal Durand, but I, I, I draw parallels with um, the, the due diligence process um, where, uh, where I'm in the lead. And what I've always said there is that I do think it's very important that there is a healthy um, sparring relationship between supervisors and businesses or supervisors, and in this case, perhaps the financial sector, um, and that uh, businesses, rather than being afraid to ask questions of how do I apply this or this this will not work for me, um, that they can go to supervisors with those questions or they can flag them even to AFRAG or others um, and ask for help without having the fear of being caught out. Um, and I think that is also very important in due diligence because there too, um, the point is not a perfect scorecard and a perfect report card, at least in due diligence. If that would happen, then you know that there are problems. And I have a little bit of the, the same philosophy here in the teething phase of this. I think it'll be very important that there is indeed um, that sparring relationship or at least that, that, that question can be posed in a, um, in a free way or that problems can be flagged without then the fear of, being caught out um, or, or worse, um, because I do think that we're all aware that um, in this whole uh, transition, um, we're doing a lot at the same time. Um, and uh, people on the receiving end of that um, have said to me many times um, that the practicalities, of course, are um, not enviable. So, so that's maybe my, my 10 cents on this. No, thank you. And that comes to the corporate governance piece maybe in a moment. Just, just maybe one or two other follow-up ones, because I think you make a really good point. At the moment, people view this also, and that's something else we want to explore today, as a compliance burden, you know, extra cost and everything. But both AFRAC and the ISSB, and I think the co-legislators also make clear that companies should look at the opportunities, because there's a lot of opportunities that if you're kind of ahead of your transition, 
uh, pathway if you within your sector are doing a good job, if you're particularly transparent, this could actually benefit you, you know, through easier funding, through reputation management, through engagement with your customers. The I mean, I'd be interested to hear your views on that. The challenge many companies face when it comes to opportunities is that they are kind of theoretical. So you can have great, you can pretend you've got great opportunities and then you realize actually maybe they weren't so great in five years time and then you can be accused of greenwashing. So how, I mean, it'd be interesting to hear about that relationship between, you know, the disclosure and the opportunities and what you would like to see as opportunities for the industry. Hmm. I think that's a, a, a difficult one. Um, also, perhaps because I've I've often got my um, due diligence glasses on, and I know we're not talking about that here now. But um, the things that I mentioned before on um, the, the 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 granularity um, or the, the further reporting that will be needed. Um, when it comes to things like, I mentioned them before, collective bargaining, um, equal treatment, business ethics, whistleblowing, all these sort of metrics that companies now will need to provide further insight on. Um, as I said, I think all of those um, are things that um, often might not make it to the boardroom. What you know in something like collective bargaining is that if there's very little coverage of that, then probably you will have a workforce that is more ready to walk away. Um, if you have no systems for whistleblowing, then uh, you are more likely as a company to get exposed fully um, and definitively, then if you have systems, grievance mechanisms, mediation systems, and so forth. And so some of these things might sound warm and fuzzy, um, but especially also through my work on due diligence, I have seen that really, really they are not from um, preventing multi-million uh, dollar court cases that only make it to the boardroom once compliance costs and, and legal costs get out of hand, um, you know, um, to, to, to very uh, fundamental things like um, health and safety at work and, 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 and scandals in, in the press. Um, I think all of these things, as I said, um, if they can be managed, um, if they can be managed more soundly, if they can provide insights that a company didn't have or perhaps that was um, in silos and didn't make it into the right people, um, then I truly think that that can make a business more sound and it can make a business and a business model more sustainable. Um, that to me is is really a, a, a wish um, for this. That is something else I think than what you perhaps were aiming at, the, the maybe more external benefits of this, um, but, but I'll leave it here. No, I think you, you make a really good point. Before I come to the governance piece uh, now, to just remind everybody, I realize that actually you can kind of join the conversation and, and please do ask questions now and so on. And if, if what, depending if anything comes in, I will try and integrate that into the conversation with Lara, but also for the rest of the morning, I will remind you again later as well. But on the corporate governance, I think you're absolutely right. I think one of the interesting things, and you see that also in the draft standards of EFRAG, is about the governance. It's how, how board organize themselves, how they organize their risk management, how they think through their entire business strategy and, and you know, build that around ESG or build ESG into it. Uh, and I agree with you. I think that's actually one of the most innovative elements of this. It's not just about reporting. It's about thinking through the process. And as you said, you're the rapporteur on that file. It was kind of an, an interesting file in the commission's drafting phase. <laughs> it went back and forth in different directions. Different DGs seem to be waking up at different times. So I think it'd be a very interesting file uh, for you to, to, to lead on. Um, I think we were quite, from the financial services side, I think the feeling is I've seen more relaxedness about the file because there's much more governance already built into financial services process than, let's say, some of the manufacturing industries where, where there's more nervousness. What's your expectation? Obviously, whenever, uh, it's only part of it, but whenever a director is, is brought in to have a certain responsibility, people get very nervous as to what that means. So, so you've alluded to this already, but, but how do you see the corporate governance file and the CSRD interacting, and what is your expectations for, for the outcome of the CS, uh, sorry, the CS Triple D negotiations? Mm -hmm. It's early, but if you had your, your wish, so to speak. Um, <clears throat> I think my wish for um, the due diligence file, um, 
I am. Um, I still find it difficult to say. See, uh, I don't. I don't even know if I can say the acronym, the, the triple D one. I just call it due diligence. But my my wish there is that we can get to uh, sound and meaningful due diligence practices um, that actually make a difference. And I say that because I think that in the current Commission proposal, um, we risk actually taking a step back. And to focus uh, on the financial industry, perhaps, um, given the audience here, if I am told by uh, a large Dutch bank that I will not name, but that their uh, compliance practices um, uh, at the moment um, go further than what is asked here, um, and what, with that I mean that a bank might ask difficult questions um, before giving uh, an SME a loan. Um, but if in the proposal that's on the table, um, it says, well, those difficult questions, they, they only really need to be asked at the beginning, but they don't need to be asked to a company on a, uh, or to a, a company that's been given a loan on an ongoing basis, then I think that that's a step back. Or if in the proposal it says, well, actually, SMEs won't come into this, or um, uh, SMEs, they don't need to perform due diligence themselves, then that creates a problem. Um, because a bank will be expecting um, that SME to be doing due diligence in order for it to give it a loan. So essentially, um, in, in summary, if I hear that, uh, that, that banks or financial institutions are, are doing more at the moment in terms of due diligence than is being asked by the Commission, um, then I think that that's a danger. So in a nutshell, my wish is that we don't uh, take a step back in time, but that we do something that is uh, meaningful and impactful on, on the ground. Um, the director's duties part of this or the corporate governance part of this is a uh, small part. It's, it's meaningful, it's important. Um, but there's a reason, of course, that the Commission scrapped a lot of that um, in here um, and I think that is because it is sensitive and I think the, the due diligence fight and just to be clear what we're talking about there is um, responsible business conduct practices for companies with uh, value chains uh, that are that are complex uh, for multinationals that might be operating outside of the EU and, and, and dealing with many different um, uh, stakeholders and, and, uh, and different um, uh, parts in their in their value chain. Um, so what, what uh, uh, my hope is, is that what we can ask of them, which is risk-based due diligence, i.e. focusing on where they think uh, the salient risks for their particular business, for their particular business model and sector lie, um, that, that is what would be my, my wish. And at the moment, um, that is something that I am more focused on than um, the, the type of director's duties that I think industry is so concerned about. If anything, for director's duties and the corporate governance piece, what I want to achieve is that due diligence becomes uh, chefsache. And I've used that word before. I, I am quite sure that it's not just the Dutch borrowing a German word, but that it gets used in, in German too. But what I want to make sure is that due diligence issues, so ESG issues, um, um, and, and issues uh, pertaining to the environment, human rights, governance throughout companies' value chains, that those issues make it to boardrooms. Not every and any issues, but that issues that are salient risks to the business and to the wider world, that those make it into the boardroom. Well, it's interesting you say this, and I think actually to give you an example, you know, we, we in SME, the amount of questions we're now getting from our clients, not, not for lending purposes, but just for them to understand the value chain is quite incredible, actually. Uh, not necessarily bad, it makes us think about our own environmental impact or social impact and so on. But it's interesting, it's already gone into those levels of granularity. But you raised two interesting points I want to pick up on. One is materiality, because you say it can't be everything. It needs to be the most salient things. And we talk a lot today about materiality and how to define materiality. So any views you have on that. And the other one is scope, the other big issue, which is you're right. The, both the CSRD and the uh, corporate sustainability proposal, because I also don't like CSDD as a term, mm -hmm. uh, will ultimately impose requirements also on the holding companies or on companies outside the EU that provide businesses or services uh, into Europe. And that's creating some confusion because there's voice about conflicting laws and so on between different jurisdictions. And the other one is value chain management. People are worried as to how much control they have over maybe their immediate suppliers, but the suppliers of their suppliers, it becomes much more nebulous. 
So these are more operational issues, but uh, any thoughts you have on those? I think scope will become a very big issue because people are very worried about that. Yeah, and in terms of scope, uh, what you are meaning right now is the the, uh, the companies that were asking to perform due diligence um, and then also the companies outside of the EU that, that we will be asking yeah. this. Yeah, yes. yeah. Um, I, we, we had similar conversations on, on CSRD and that, and um, I think we live in a, in a time where it's very difficult for us to say we have expectations from our European companies on how they do business. Um, but companies coming from outside the EU, um, um, uh, putting services uh, or, or placing products on our markets, um, we have we have fewer demands of, of them. That is something that um, I think politically cannot be sold because logically it cannot be sold. Um, and um, you know, I think we have the the, the phrase "our market, our rules." Um, if we want to be serious about um, making an impact, about this transition, about um, uh, uh, double materiality, I mean, then that means that we cannot we cannot go and arbitrarily say, well, um, it's good enough if our European companies behave in a certain way, because also that would be uh, distortive and it would make certain of them very unhappy and say, well, I'm being undercut here by companies that can have a business model of, of cutting corners that don't need to be so diligent. Um, and that is not fair. So so that is the, the environment we're working in, of course, being very conscious that uh, in practical terms, um, you know, how how do you impose something like this? We even had this conversation in CSRD. Um, you know, I, I was in the US not long ago, and um, you know, you might be able to say that for products placed on a market, um, you can have a, a blunt instrument of a, a product ban. Um, although there too, uh, there's there's very many people saying it's 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 a nightmare in practice and very difficult for businesses. But um, if already um, for products. Um, things aren't simple, then what does that mean for services uh, and so forth in terms of how do you um, how do you supervise this? How do you 